Hello, everyone. Are you enjoying the conference? How's everyone doing? Good. I'm enjoying very much. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Carmen. I'm a software engineer at DeepMind Health. I'm actually one of the technical leads at DeepMind Health as well. And um, a few years ago, we decided to adopt Go as part of actually our main language for our infrastructure. And what I'd like to talk about today is some of, some of our findings and experiences during this time. Why do I think this is relevant for you? I don't know if any of you has ever worked in healthcare. Someone? A few people. So what were your experiences? What can you tell me about? What's special about working in healthcare? Security. There are like many big challenges, like security. Um, for us, when we started working on this, it was about three years ago. And for DeepMind, it was, uh, it was a totally new field. We had no previous experience in, in healthcare. And in all this time, we've, we've learned a lot. And we found some things that we think are very interesting about working on healthcare and about working in clinic, with clinical data. Um, so today, I'm going to focus on three of those things. The first one is about parsing clinical data or making sense of clinical data. This is, um, for us, that means that we have to deal with legacy protocols. And I know, I, I know this maybe sounds boring, but uh, I think we found a kind of elegant solution to, to solve this problem. The second is going to be, uh, I'm going to talk about our simulation infrastructure. So this is about how we actually make development and testing possible without using real data. And the third one is about verifiable data audit. And this is about how we audit access to this sensitive data in a way that can be verified both internally and also by external, by external parties. So before I, I, I go into more details, let me introduce briefly what DeepMind is and what, uh, what the company does. So DeepMind is a British um, artificial intelligence research company. So the main focus of DeepMind is, the mission of DeepMind is to solve intelligence. And there have been a few breakthroughs in this field. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, AlphaGo. So AlphaGo was a computer system that two years ago was able to beat one of the Go masters at, at playing Go. And actually that was mentioned this morning by a talk. Um, yeah, some, someone mentioned, mentioned AlphaGo this morning, and I was very happy because actually he gave a lot of details about how AlphaGo works, which I, I, I don't have time to, to do now. I'm actually a little bit sad because he stole my joke about this is Go, the board game, not the programming language. But well, what, what can you do? So um, anyway, this, is, this was a huge breakthrough in the artificial intelligence community. And such a huge breakthrough that experts had anticipated that this would not happen for at least 10 years. And that actually happened two years ago. So that's part of what DeepMind does. Um, DeepMind does research on artificial intelligence. The second part of what DeepMind does is actually we try to apply that research to solve some of the most complex problems in our society. And one of those is healthcare. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of background about what working in healthcare means for us. And I'm going to tell you a story. So this, this is Afia. Afia was um, admitted at the Royal Free Hospital here in London one year ago. She was in labor, and things didn't really go as expected. She required urgent surgery. And then after the surgery, things got complicated. She developed sepsis, which is an, a blood infection, and that led to acute kidney injury, which is a condition of the kidney, and that can actually lead to kidney failure. So she was actually very sick. She got very sick, and, and nobody detected that. My team develops an app that is called Streams, and this is an app that we are making available to clinicians working in hospitals. So these are doctors and nurses working in hospitals. So actually, through analyzing some of, the, some of Afia's blood tests, Streams was able to detect that she had a problem with her kidneys. And an alert was sent to a specialist doctor, to a specialist, uh, specialist kidney doctor. 
So this doctor was able to coordinate with the clinical team that was taking care of Afia. They changed her medicines, and she eventually got better. She recovered the kidney function, and she was able to go back home, and she was discharged and was able to go back home with her newborn baby. So that was a happy story. So what Streams does it's, is it um, puts together information that is relevant for clinicians in a single place. So for instance, the information we have available is uh, uh, some of the latest uh, test results. We have information about the vital signs of the patient that can be like blood pressure or heart rate. And it also sends alerts when, when we think that the patient requires urgent attention. And um, one thing to have into account here is that in this case, what made a huge difference to, to the story, to Afia, is a mobile application and a push notification. Right? So that's something that, depending on where you work, that's something that you give for granted, mobile applications, push notifications. But actually, when you work in healthcare, that's high tech for hospitals. Um, you think of the NHS, which is where we work, most hospitals in the NHS still work with pagers and fax machines. And there are thousands of people in the UK hospitals that die because of sepsis or acute kidney injury only because the warning signs could not be picked up in time. So we are talking about a field in which a mobile application and a push notification makes a huge difference. There is no AI in streams. I know I mentioned that actually DeepMind is very well known for um, research in artificial intelligence. There is nothing about um, that in streams because you can already make a huge impact with just putting a little bit of basic technology into hospitals. So let's, uh, I'm going to give an overview about how streams work and what's our infrastructure. Um, so this is the, our stack. The, uh, on the left-hand side are the hospital systems. So the way hospitals work is they have different IT systems that handle different data. So for instance, they will have a system that handles admissions and discharges, another system that does the, the, the test results, for instance, or gets the results from the laboratories. And all those systems communicate um, with each other using something called HL7 messages. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about HL7 in a, in a bit. Um, so basically what Streams does, we connect to that infrastructure, which is existing infrastructure in the, in the hospitals, we um, analyze, we parse the data, we make sense of the data, we analyze it, and then we decide whether we need to alert a clinician or not. Um, so those are the two components here, persistence and analysis. We also, of course, have, have some serving APIs so that the app can interact with our backends, both um, displaying the data or even writing data. And uh, we try to do that using open source uh, technologies when possible. So for instance, all these runs in a custom data center in a Kubernetes cluster. We also use Kafka for communi internal communication between, between, uh, between our components. And there is actually a gRPC layer here um, to access the, what we call a fire repository. So a fire repository, fire is another standard for healthcare interoperability. So you can think of it like a, a more modern HL7. And uh, this actually is something that is starting to be adopted by many healthcare organizations. And we actually believe in it. We think that this is going to be, is going to enable a lot of innovation in the future in, the, in healthcare. So that's why we decided to, um, to, to implement it in our services as well, hoping that in the future we would be able to provide access through this, uh, this FIRE repository instead of HL7 that, as we will see now, is a little bit more cumbersome. So I, I said that we talk about three things. This is the first one, and it's about parsing and making sense of clinical data. You probably by now are dying to see what this HL7 looks like. Um, this... <laughs> So this is uh, one message in HL7. I know, I know that you are laughing, but um, <laughs> and I, I laughed the first time I saw this as well. But think that if this is how your clinical data is transferred between services right now. So if, if your clinical data right now is 
have to move from one way to another, this is, the, this is how it is done in 95% of the cases. And probably the other 5% is someone printing your data and giving it to someone else. So I know <laughs> it's a nervous laugh, maybe. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, so as I said, this is HL7, this is version 2, is the most widely implemented um, protocol or standard for um, uh, exchanging clinical data between systems. This is from the 80s. Um, so you can't see that, but it's like, it's the 80s calling, they want their protocol back. Um, this was released in 1987 and is still used by um, most of the healthcare systems today. Um, so, as you can see, there is a lot of things going on in here. Um, let's, uh, let's go a little, bit about, uh, a little bit in detail about what all this information means. So, the lowest level of, um, of entities in HL7 is uh, fields, and fields are just like a piece of data, of information, and that's the lowest level, and they have a type. Uh, so, for instance, in this case, it's about the name of a patient then fields are composed or grouped into segments uh, that also have a type. So in this case, this is a segment that is called PID that stands for patient identification. And this PID segment can have other fields as well. So we saw it has the patient name. It also has other um, identifiers to, to identify the patient. Then all these segments are grouped into messages and messages have a type as well. So in this case, the type is here, which is ORU. So this means that this is a message that will transmit data about the test results for a patient. And the type of message defines which segments will go into that message. So for instance, uh, we'll have some information about the patient, we'll have some information about what, is this, what are these results about, or who ordered those, uh, those tests, for instance. And then here, all these OBX segments are actually the, the results. So we'll have a result for creatinine or a result for antibodies or, or whatever was ordered. So, um, so message types uh, are actually defined in a tree-like structure, which is, which is as, as a computer scientist, I see this and I, I really like it because it's like, it has a structure, right? I, I can do this, I can parse it, I can make sense of this. So this uh, being such an widely implemented protocol, for sure, it's very easy to access this information and to know which message types uh, we have available and what they mean, right? Um, so this is all um, <laughs> in a 960-page PDF that you can download, you can read. Not very good for um, machines to understand. There is um, a machine-readable version this is a table that specifies what a PID segment, what we saw before, means, which kind of uh, fields and which type and whether we are, they are repeated or not. And you can actually uh, get that information as well in a very easy um, and accessible way. But um, so let's say, <laughs> let's say you have that information. So uh, you know what the messages look like. Now we need to actually um, process them and extract the information that we're interested in. And we do that in two steps. So the first one, and I'll, I'll explain later why we do it in two steps. Uh, the first one is to, um, from all these uh, schemas, we need to generate something that our Go code can understand. So the first step for us is we read those schemas and we transform them into Go structs. And this is all done yeah, it's like kind of auto-generated code. And we generate structs for everything, like data types, for segments, for messages, for everything. So here we have some, uh, uh, some fields, some segments, and then finally we also have this data for, for messages. So now we have the structs where we have to um, put our data. And then after that, the second step is to actually parse the message. And uh, we decided to do that on the fly. So the same way we actually auto-generate the code for the structs, we don't do that for the parsing. I'll explain now why. 
And this is an example of the code we use for parsing. So we use recursion, we use reflection, and uh, so by the time the message arrives, we try to make sense of that data and making it fit into the buckets of or the different message types that we have. And so the reason why we decided to do it like this is because, because HL7 is a standard, and as every other standard, everyone will have its own version of the standard. So we needed a way to make it extendable. And uh, so for instance, and uh, the, th the, the thing is that um, we wanted to take advantage of uh, the type safety in Go as much as possible. So for instance, when we parse a message, if there is a field that is supposed to be number, and uh, there is a letter there, we, we fail. We say, well, I can't parse this because I'm expecting a number, and I'm getting something I can't parse. But this doesn't really work for us because, um, for instance, we, we, we can go to a trust and say, you are giving us this message, it's actually not compliance with the specification. Uh, and, this is, and they say, well, but in this field, we've always put the ID of the, of the, uh, the clinician, which is a number, and then also a code, uh, with the, whether the, the clinician is a, is a GP or, or something, right? Um, so basically, we have to extend our, or we have to enrich maybe our way of parsing the data to account for these little differences. Also, between trusts, they will also have differences. So that's something that we fix as well in the parsing. When we do the parsing, we have all these um, maybe uh, special cases that we fix. So that by the time the parsing is done, we know that we have a good HL7 parsed message and everything is good. This is also useful for us because sometimes um, different trusts will use the format, the, the HL7 in a different way. So for instance, the, if there is a field that is supposed to, com to, to include, I don't know, the, uh, the postcode of the patient, sometimes they would send it in a different field. And, uh, but you don't really want your um, business logic to have to deal with that, right? To have if trust is royal free, then do that. Then if trust is something else, then do something else. So we try to remove all those differences between, the, between how trust use HL7 now in the parsing stage. And that's actually done thanks to this, the, the, this token. So in this token, um, we have information about where we are in the message, which segment we are in, and then we can have our custom code, custom code there. Okay, so the second part is about simulating clinical data. And um, so I, I don't know, I don't know where, where, where um, the, the space where you work, but um, so DeepMind was acquired by Google four years ago. So many of the people working on DeepMind, like myself, I used to be at Google before. So I have a, a, my experience was not in healthcare, it was in something totally different. And of course it depends on, on where you work, but uh, the data we used to work with was not very sensitive. So if you find a, a bug in your code that you know that some requests uh, uh, cost, you can fix the bug and then replay all those requests and then see, okay, the, the bug is fixed. You can't do that with clinical data. Actually, we are legally not allowed to use real data for development. And even if we were allowed to use um, real data for development, we don't want to do that because we want to minimize who has access to that data because it's very sensitive data. So, um, but we need a way to test our system. So what do we do? We can't use a real hospital. We create our own hospital. So uh, this is what this project is about. This, this is about simulating a hospital. And for us, that means simulating the two main entry points to our application. In this case, the HL7 messages and the clinicians. So we simulate patients. And for us, that means to simulate events that happen to those patients. So those patients arrive to our simulated hospital and things happen to them. And then those things are translated into HL7 messages. And then on the other hand, we also simulate the clinicians that use the streams app to visualize that data about the patients. So simulating patients, um, we, uh, so we needed a, a way to specify 
what can happen to a patient in a hospital. And that's something that in the healthcare field is called clinical pathway. So this is a sequence of events that are relevant or medically relevant for a patient. And we needed a way to specify this in a, uh, in a way that is machine readable and also in a way that is human readable because we want our clinicians to look at the pathways that we have designed and say, yeah, actually this pathway makes sense um, or no, this doesn't make sense. And I don't know if what you see here makes a lot of sense to you. Um, for our clinicians, it actually does. Um, so you can specify, and we, we uh, design this language, which is basically YAML, so we parse all of this in YAML, and we design this in a way that it could be easily understood by our clinicians. So for instance, we can specify which is the age of the person or gender, or um, historical data, this is about what happened to the patient before they arrived to the hospital. Maybe we have data about the previous visit, and sometimes this actually can be relevant. And then, uh, here in Pathway, we actually have the sequence of events that happen to the, to the patient once they arrive to the hospital. So they are admitted, and then there is some delay, and then there is a result and something happens. So this is, um, we can control how often patients arrive to the hospital, and then when they do, we assign one of these pathways based actually on a probability that that pathway would happen in real life. So that's what this percentage of patients mean. And we also have cool ways to um, kind of to simulate if there's an emergency or a disaster or something, and then you suddenly have 100 patients arriving to the hospital per minute. So we have uh, also it's good for load testing and things like that. And then the second part is about simulating clinicians. And we do this in two, um, in two steps. The first one is actually recording what we call a user journey. So the main entity for simulating patients was, was this clinical pathway. The main entity for simulating clinicians is a user journey. And a user journey is an interaction that the clinician takes with the app. So maybe it clicks here and there, and then it visualizes some results about the patient. And that's, again, something that we design together with, with the clinicians, and something, something that makes sense. So the first, the, first, um, the first step for us is to hard code all those uh, interactions. This is actually Swift code. Um, and in this case, this is a user journey of a clinician that wants, wants to start a patient. So Streams allows you to, to start patients so that you can follow up with them or something. Um, so this is the code that would actually do that in, a, a, in, in the Streams app. And uh, this runs in the iOS simulator. And while this is running, or all these user journeys are running, we capture the network requests that are happening. And that means that later, someone like me who has no idea about front-end development, I can go and replay all the requests and actually simulate that there are clinicians using the app. So this has worked very well for us. And it, it allows us to, to do a lot of load testing and uh, it, it, actually, it, in, we have found some bugs thanks to this. So you can think that you can find bugs because maybe your, your app is making requests that don't exist in the back end. And maybe if you don't have something like this, you would have to go and go to the app and inspect that actually the data looks good. But if you have something like this, you can very easily see that actually those requests you are making are failing all the time. There is, um, so another thing that we discovered is that um, there, are, there are, maybe everything is working well and your app is working well, but you are not doing things in an efficient way. So for instance, what was happening to us is that uh, there is a screen in which we show test results for a patient. We were actually making a single, or single request for every test result. And we discovered that through, through this tool, and we actually have the capability in the back end to send a bundle request. So that means that we could get the results with just one request instead of 10 or 100. So that's something that you can, again, discover with this. Um, we also run into some very interesting problems because what we wanted is to record as, 
as little as possible. So we want to record in one of our test environments, and we want to replay in as many environments as we can. So can you think of what can go wrong with, with that approach? So the, the key is um, here. Okay, so what this code does is um, give me a, a patient that is called AKI. And in the, in the environment where this runs, maybe there is a patient that is called AKI, and we can go through the rest of the, of the user journey and click on the patient and see the, the information. But what happens, you try to replay this in an environment that does not have a patient that is called AKI. So we actually needed a way to map what was happening when we were recording user journeys, which is the request that we were making, which is the response that we are getting, and compare that to what happens when we actually replay those journeys and try to map. If I, uh, if I search for this, then I would click on this and then try to do the same on the, uh, when we replay the user, the user journeys in a different environment. So we have a lot of code that does randomization as well, so that, for instance, you would, not, you would then always click on the first patient, if, even if the, um, if the user journey was recorded to always click on the first patient. Because it also happened to us that um, there is this user journey that adds information about the patient, so it will add um, blood pressure or, 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 or um, heart rate or something like that. We, will always add, we were always adding information to the same patient, and at some point um, we have like 10,000 data points, and the, the app couldn't, couldn't handle that. So that's, why, that's because we were not randomizing the, the requests. So this is, the, this is the last part I'm going to talk about, and this is about how to verify the data access, which is, as someone mentioned before, is actually very important for in terms of privacy and security when you're working with, with clinical data. Um, so there are many organizations right now that trust of their organizations with processing data on their behalf. So for instance, we as DeepMind, we process test results from the Royal Free Hospital so that we can send alert to, alerts to clinicians. So we are data processors. And this is uh, something that happens in other fields as well. For instance, uh, restaurants would trust open table to do reservations for them. But you as a user, you you, don't, you have to put the trust on those organizations, and you have to trust that they will actually um, use your data appropriately, and they will not misuse it. And uh, there is little control or transparency about what happens to, to your data. So this is what we are trying to solve with verifiable data audits. The main entity of a verifiable data audit is what we call verifiable audit log. So this is what you would think of a, a normal application log in which you have an entry about some data access that happened and why, and together with that, you also store a, a cryptographic hash of what that entry means. But it's not only about what that entry contains, but you also store what previous entries are. So the cryptographic hash will depend on your current entry and all the previous entries. So what that means is that if your current entry uh, changes, your cryptographic hash will change, and if a previous entry changes, your cryptographic hash will change as well. This is an example of a, one of these verifiable audit logs. So there are like different things that happen, or who actually had access, or who accessed this specific piece of data, and why, and uh, together with that, we also have a cryptographic hash. So once you have that, you can have uh, the last piece of the puzzle, which is the log verifiers. So these are trusted entities that will verify that the log is correct and it has not been tampered. And it can be th this can be done because an audit log will publish the, the, the different keys or different cryptographic hashes, and the log verifier will be, will be able to uh, run some very smart cryptographic functions and, and verify that actually uh, the log has not been tampered. And this is all possible because of structure that is called Merkle trees. I don't have time to go into details for that, uh, but you can look it up. Um, the main idea is that we would have the entries as the leaves of the tree, 
and then for each, uh, basically we compute the hashes of those entries, and then the nodes are a combination of the hashes of the children. So if you do that, then um, uh, you would go up the, the tree, that's a log verifier, and then basically a log verifier, what it needs to do is it needs the hashes of one entry plus the siblings, and then it can actually verify that the log has not been tampered. So this is something that um, can be done by trusted organizations. In our case, for instance, we hope that organizations like the NHS Digital, which are already trusted, would implement a, a verifier like that, but this could actually be implemented by, by any entity. And uh, what's interesting about this is that once the, uh, the data has been verified, um, we'd also like, so, so let's say uh, there is this uh, verifier and uh, uh, it has access to, to this verified log and it can summarize it, it can uh, try to even detect for anomalies or problems. But once you have that, then maybe what you, you would like to do is to, um, to, uh, to, to give that information to patients so that they know what actually happened to their data or who has access to that data and why. And for that, we are, um, it's still an idea, but we were thinking that we could probably piggyback on methods that the NHS has today to give this information to patients. So for instance, right now, if you are discharged from a hospital, you could get a, a, a piece of paper with information about your visit to the hospital. So after something like this is implemented, maybe we could add something like a URL or a link where you could go and actually see what happened to your data and who, who got access to that data and why, which we believe will give or will improve the transparency around um, all this sensitive data. So yeah, that's, that's basically what I wanted to tell you about. Uh, just to recap, we talked about safely persisting data and how to parse it. We talked about simulating data that you can't or don't want to use. And we've also talked about verifiably auditing access to, to that data. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, in case you have one. But well, thank you very much for your attention. Um, so, okay, so we have, um, you probably can't do that. So we, we are, because we need to do our job, right? So if we see that a certain message has not been processed and we don't know why, we need actually someone to, to inspect that message and, and see why. So the question is how do you solve the problem of, of the, uh, the integer that was, uh, that was not actually an integer without looking at the data? And for debugging, we, we are allowed to see, to see the data. Whenever we need to access that data for debugging, we actually need to, uh, the, there is a whole process around it, and we need uh, justification and everything. Uh, and you only get access to the data for as long as you need to fix the problem. But yeah, in that case, it would require someone to actively look at the message and then identify the problem was in this field because there was a, a, a V, for instance, and we were only expecting an, an integer. More questions? Yep. In uh, the overview of your uh, program, the architecture of your program, yeah. there was uh, an item labeled Kafka. What does it do? So, um, yeah, probably many people here will be able to answer that better than me. Um, so, Kafka is a, an open source technology, it's very similar to PubSub. So that's a way of uh, making components communicate in a very decoupled way. So you would have uh, topics and uh, someone that publishes something in that topic and then someone would read that data. So for instance, in this case, what we do is um, you would we would get a message here, HL7 message, and then uh, we would persist it. And then we would put a message here in Kafka saying, hey, I just persisted message A, B, C, D, E. And then this guy here could go get the ID and then get the message and then pr analyze it. Mark, yeah, at the back. Um, 
Yes, um, it, it's very similar to blockchain. Um, so it's very similar in the sense that, so the question is uh, how different is the verifiable data logs to blockchain? And um, so there are things that are similar. For instance, in the logs, it's append only. You can't remove, which is something very similar to blockchain. And another thing is that it can be verified, which again is similar to blockchain. The main difference is that in block blockchain is decentralized. You basically uh, don't trust anyone or everyone, depending on how you look at it. So you, you need to reach consensus about has this data or has this log been tampered or not. In our case, we already have a trusted entity because healthcare works like this. So we don't need all the extra computation that a consensus would require. So the, uh, the cryptography is much more efficient because we have a trusted entity. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different, yeah. More questions? Yeah, one more. Sorry, I, I didn't hear your question. So the question is, um, in a verifiable log, I can verify that you haven't tampered the log, but I can't verify that you actually wrote the entry in the first place. It's, uh, I guess it's very hard to protect against malicious users, so someone that actually maliciously will not log that entry. Um, one thing we, we, we do in our case is we actually have an audit of our technology so um, I, uh, we can prove that in every technology or every way we have to access data, we actually have all these audits um, kind of embedded. So there is no way you could bypass that. But I think, I think that's probably the, the only thing you can't do. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you again.